Okay, let us get going for today. Um, using a different setup and different computers. So apologies that uh, it took me a couple of minutes to get set up today. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Let's see if um, there's a thumbs up from someone so you can hear me okay. Yes, perfect, good. Uh, thank you so much for joining us again after our uh, one week uh, hiatus. Um, great to see all of you back for the queer politics webinar. Uh, I'm now, not that you care, moved uh, location from North Carolina to New Jersey. Um, so now coming through from, uh, from my house in uh, Princeton, which is about the same temperature as North Carolina, surprisingly. Um, and today we are very excited to have a conversation with Paisley Curra. Uh, just to let you know on the, uh, the ground rules for our meeting, um, we're going to have about a half an hour, 25 minute conversation between Paisley and myself uh, on the issues uh, of importance for um, many of us in scholarship and advocacy today. And uh, then I will take, as usual, questions, comments um, from the audience. If you could send me a chat message, that seems to work pretty well. Uh, and I will um, put you on a list of questions and comments you can um, have with Paisley. And uh, just to remind you that next week, uh, we have another conversation with a politician who is a member of parliament in the United Kingdom for Livingston, um, Hannah Bardell, the Scottish, member, Scottish National Party member of parliament for Livingston in Scotland, who will be talking to us about um, LGBTQ politics and public policy in Scotland and what an independent Scotland might actually um, do for queer rights for LGBTQ people and their uh, aspirations in that regard. But today, uh, we're very excited to have with us uh, really one of, if not the leading scholar um, around issues of trans and queer politics, gender non-conforming and non-binary politics. Um, somebody who's been very helpful uh, in giving me advice over the years as I began to dip my toe into this field. Paisley is a professor of political science at Brooklyn College and also the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Um, originally, I believe from Canada um, uh, with uh, an MA, uh, sorry, a BA from Queen's University in Kingston and an MA and PhD from Cornell. Uh, as many of you know, um, Paisley is one of the founding editors of Transgender Studies Quarterly, TSQ, the journal, uh, with Susan Stryker, and has published extensively in the field around issues of identity, um, legal uh, provisions for gender identity, uh, and discrimination and public policy issues. Uh, most notably, Corpus, an inter interdisciplinary reader on bodies and knowledge, and the book Transgender Rights, and a series of other articles. Um, Paisley also combines, uh, I think like many of us, advocacy with scholarship, um, so has been a board member with the Transgender Law and Policy Institute in America and the International Global Action for Trans Equality, Gates, and has worked extensively on advising for the state and city of New York as well. So um, one thing that I uh, am always interested in exploring with our um, guests and our participants in this seminar is, is their um, narrative history of working and coming into these fields, um, how they find their place within both academia and in advocacy. Um, but before we begin those sort of personal narrative questions, Paisley actually posted uh, on social media um, a provocative title, which could be cut a number of different ways. That might be a great way of starting. Um, the title was, Can We Stop Talking About Transphobia? And let's start with that. Um, can we stop talking about transphobia? Should we stop? 
it's so funny. I've been teaching on Zoom for a while now, and I still forget to unmute myself. But um, Andrew, thanks so much for such a gener such a generous introduction. It's kind of funny because in my career at various stages, I had no reputation. And now I have this reputation that is like way bigger than I am. It's just kind of hilarious, these introductions, because I feel like it sounds so much uh, better than the, my accomplishments. But anyways, it's always nice to have that. Um, and it's nice to see some familiar faces um, and names on the, uh, in the participants list. So I'm very, I'm very glad about that. So yeah, the title was meant to be provocative. Can we stop talking about transphobia? And we probably can't because it is built into the structures of the non, I, I, it's built into so many different structures in terms of organizing thought about gender nonconformity under the category of transgender. It's built into so many different fundraising apparatuses in the US and even internationally. So if you're doing work around gender nonconformity to be like, sometimes to be legible to like a institution like the Ford Foundation, you just have to use these words like transgender. Um, so, you know, it's become this currency uh, that is important to get resources uh, to the groups that need them. But it also, as you all know, probably maybe better than I do, it kind of collapses all, all these kinds of differences all these kinds of differences um, into one thing. So um, I'll talk. So I'll talk a little bit more about that at the um, at the end. But I guess I'll just say, even though this is being recorded, I guess I'll just say this kind of um, anecdote I kind of always sort of have in my head, which is like, and, and it applies to me as private as much as any as much as the folks I'm talking about. But you know, the idea when I give a talk at a private liberal arts college and some student who, you know, reads his white, stands up and talks about transphobia and talks about, you know, the likelihood of them being incarcerated is like six times anybody else. And I'm like, you know, I'm transgender. I have very little likelihood of being incarcerated. You know, I mean, yes, I could kill somebody. I, you know, that would be bad and I'd probably go to jail. But like, you know, I have this 10, I have a tenure. I'm a full professor. The student at the, the liberal arts college talk, their biggest danger is probably getting a job at Goldman Sachs, not being incarcerated. So there's a way in which this this category like creates this narrative that puts all these people who have very different vulnerabilities to um, you know poverty, incarceration, health in the same kind of category of discrimination. So that's my very short um, short riff on um, transphobia, um, but it's an effective term because it mob it mobilizes people, and you know no one wants to be transphobic. Even J.K. Rowling doesn't want to be transphobic. She wants to say things that are very much against the interests of 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 uh, people whose gender identity isn't associated with their birth sex, but you know if you call her transphobic, she will sue you if you're in England. So, but uh, yeah. So, um, as you said, over time, perhaps even your position in the field and you know your notoriety <laughs> has changed as attention has been more visited upon gender identity issues. So I would be really interested in understanding your journey in studying these issues from being a graduate student, from being an undergrad, both as a scholar, but also as a trans person. Um, how has the field changed? I mean, do you find that there is now more space and more acknowledgement and you're less the marginalized child than you were before? Or is that a bit of a misnomer that in fact, the marginalization of the field is still really alive and kicking and strong. But from Cornell to today, I mean, how has the field changed in the way you feel you situate yourself in it? In yeah, and I, I guess there's two things we could talk about in terms of the field. We could talk about kind of queer studies or LGBT studies, or we could talk about transgender studies. But certainly from my perspective, which is very partial, I'm in New York, I teach at the City University of New York. I work with a lot of trans studies scholars. It seems to me that there's lots of space for people to do trans transgender studies, but that doesn't necessarily apply to everyone at every institution and you know who are you know looking for jobs or looking to find their a home for their um, a home for the publication. But there's a lot of there's a lot of work. I um, work with the students at Brooklyn College and the LGBTQA and you know, they, they keep creating new groups so they can get more money from the administration, which is great. So there's a bunch of queer and trans groups. Um, but like 
it's come to the point where I was like, I want to organize an event about sexual orientation. I want to organize an event about gay students, bi students, you know, uh, lesbian students, because it seems like everything we've done the last three years has been a, a trans speaker, a trans theme, or a trans question. So I feel like there's been this incredible explosion of interest in trans and non-binary identities um, in my particular social location. And also um, in terms of publishing, um, you know, I definitely had a beginning of my career. I wasn't, I didn't come out as trans until like 2000, 1999, but the beginning of my career, you know, I was just doing kind of queer stuff and I was an out lesbian and I couldn't get published anywhere but in law journals because they're just edited by students and they don't really care if you just send them some stuff they'll publish it um, but I don't think I got it I don't know I think my first peer-reviewed article was probably after I was a full professor like you know so which is lucky that I'm at Brooklyn College and CUNY which kind of understood uh under, didn't have the same kind of publishing pressures and also didn't really care about whether you got published in the American Political Science Review um, but I just think there's like now there's like so many more spaces for people to get um, to get uh, published. I mean, I don't think that I think there might be some political scientists here. I don't think political science is at the best right now, but um, it's not where it was uh, 20 years ago. And, and I'm reticent about mixing up the personal and professional too much, but you obviously, you know, Ken Sherrill and Pat Egan talk about how politically American LGBTQ people, especially gay men, often change their views, their values, their um, you know presentation as they come out. Right? There's a there's a coming out uh, variable that changes you. When you came out as a trans man, um, did you feel your scholarship changed? Did the way you approach your work change? No, I don't think my, I don't feel like my scholarship changed. I think though, to be honest, under the certain kind of like calculus of identity politics, I had more authority to speak on transgender issues. So that changed how I was heard and received, no doubt, like undoubtedly. So I think like the same ideas I might've had before I, people knew I was trans could be received with much more we were better received after I was writing under that identity category. And that's like a, that's a common thing. And there's, there's a lot of importance to that. And it, there's a lot of good to that. And there's some, you know, in some other ways it can be, it can be problematic. Um, but, you know, just, just another part of my biography is I didn't come out as trans until after I had tenure. So I'm not like, I wasn't some like trailblazing, you know, person in that way. Like I felt like my, colleagues were pretty good, but I wasn't going to test that out with, with uh, pre-tenure. So, um, but now there's a whole slew of, of, of uh, uh, postdocs and assistant professors who are out as trans. And um, those are the, those are the folks who are on the call can speak to it, but it does seem there's a lot more room now for people to kind of like be more out from the get-go. So, what advice might you have for younger scholars starting their careers who want as part of their menu of options to look at trans and gender identity issues? I mean, looking back on your career, which is in the middle, not over, but looking back <laughs> on your, but looking back on your career, um, uh, do you uh, have any sort of uh, lessons that you could pass on for people coming into the field now? about how to both be satisfied, but also navigate the, the mainstream that exists. Yeah, I guess I have a couple of things to say about that. And I don't know that I'm the best role model, because I mean, I'm not like teaching in a premier place with a one-one teaching load and, uh, you know, tuition benefits for my kids or anything like that. So I'm just speaking, you know, from where I am. Um, and it didn't, but from where I am, I think that the, the most important thing is to kind of write about something I hate to use this word, but it's empirical. Like, don't be driven by some theoretical agenda or even disciplinary agenda, because those, if you're driven by those agendas, your work isn't going to be as as interesting and original. I mean, it might fit more in the journals, however, but it won't be it won't be as groundbreaking as original, um, and it won't actually speak to the, tr the truth of like trans and non-binary and gender non-conforming people's lives on the ground. Because there's all these ways that for so many years that trans has been invoked um, in arguments about other things, 
in arguments about the status of the body and arguments about the, what sex is and arguments about liberalism and arguments about all these other kind of things. And the trans gets thrown out there as like, well, this is good or this is bad, but it doesn't allow people to actually look at these different communities and, and see how they're living and making their world. So I would, I would, and I know for people who are in graduate school, the theory stuff is the fun stuff and the sexy stuff. And, you know, and there's a real kind of, um, uh, fun means kind of sharing that language, but I would urge people to kind of like don't don't be driven by that kind of agenda or even the disciplinary ones. And I'm um, certainly in the political sphere. You know, we often talk about uh, the critical mass that you you need a bunch of politicians who can be you know a supporting uh, sort of safety net. Um, in the academic world, I mean, do you now feel as though you have a cohort of of fellow travelers? Do you feel as though you have a critical mass of people to support you? Did you feel that in the past? Are you finding it in political science or do you find those people elsewhere in other disciplines? Yeah, I, I haven't really found it in political science, though I have to announce that with some surprise that I was asked to be like an associate editor of the American Political Science Review. So I was like, wow, that's cool. And I even said yes. So like, but I haven't really found that in political science. And in terms of like one of the things that really matters is it seems like most of you would be aware of is like letters, right? So when I was coming up, I didn't have a lot of people who were more senior because the letters have to be written by people more senior. I didn't have people who were more senior than me who could like write me letters. Like I had Susan Stryker who was great and a hero, but to some committee, she's like works at the Lesbian and Gay Historical Society of San Francisco and who's that, you know? So, um, so I had the support of, uh, of good people, like that kind of institutional support where like a letter from the right person at the right institution will really kind of get you a good read on a grant application or a job application. But now I think there's enough trans folks and allies and non-binary folks in the, in the academy to do those letters, to do those tenure evaluations, to review those, um, to review those journal articles. And I think that's made a, made a huge difference. Maybe it's less so today, but in the past, did you ever feel frustrated that um, when uh, people looked up their, you know, Rolodex or Filofax or their computer <laughs> address book um, on, okay, I need somebody to do trans stuff. There were like two or three people and you were the go-to person um, along with maybe one or two other people. And was that a burden? Do you feel as though almost you become pigeonholed and set within a field because everybody wants you just to talk about that because you're the only person they know who has expertise in that. Um, I don't think it, it didn't feel like a burden at the time. It felt like, oh, that's cool. People want my opinions. And it's not so much that like I'm this amazing political scientist or student of gender and sexuality studies, but it's like they wanted like a trans person to speak on that. And it's fun to go and speak to people. I think the problem was is like there's just not a lot of um, you just hear, keep hearing the same voices over and over and over again. So like I just got, after a while, I got sick of hearing myself speak. And now I turned down like nine out of 10 media requests. Cause like, I don't, there's lots of better people and I'm, you know, to, to kind of get that out there. Um, so, but I didn't experience it as a burden. I should have experienced it as like a problem probably more so than I did at the time in terms of like the lack of diversity amongst the, the people who were the go-to people. Right. Um, one of the things, um, I mean, I think a lot of people that I know on this call, uh, we have like over 50 people, a lot of people are starting to uh, be interested in gender identity issues in trans and gender non-conforming politics. So maybe not as their main thing, but it's part of the raft of questions that are interesting. Do you have any advice about how to approach this field, how to ask the right questions, how to use methods that give you satisfying answers. I mean, it's in some ways become the shiny new object uh, that lots of people want to speak about, but obviously it's always a minefield in stepping into a discipline, to a field where you really have very little foundational experience background. So what mistakes are made? What sort of work is not naming names, but I mean, what advice do you have about how to do work within a field of transgender politics and law? Yeah, well, I think like the first thing is like, if you're gonna study, you know, something a so-called transgender community, like, you know, and I think everybody in the school would agree with me, like you need to have some credibility with that community. You can't just go in and like, 
you know, sit around overhearing people for, for three months and then write a book of your, the notes you took over here in their conversations. So there's been a few examples of that. Um, but I guess the other thing I would say is don't go in there with these categories intact, you know? So I think in TSQ and this special issue um, I did that Chris Hansman, I think you're on the call, was in as well. Um, it was called Making Trends Count, but there was a really good article by, um, oh my gosh, the names are escaping me, but it was, um, which I will find and I'll put in the chat or something, but it was an article about like, what are you studying? Do you need to know what they're, if they identify as transgender or do you need to know like what body parts they have and where they put them in, under different circumstances? Like don't go assuming like there's this thing of transgender that you're gonna find. Maybe you'll find a community that is trans masculine and you know, is in a certain particular geographic location that shares some cultural similarities with each other. And maybe you'll find different communities of other sorts of gender non-conforming people. But I think assuming there's this kind of transgender thing you're gonna find creates it just means that you're going to you're going to um, find the population that you you're going to invent the population you you know you're wanting to wanting to find. I remember being on one call with some institute where they're trying to figure out like how to test survey research questions, how, how to count transgender people, and they wanted to test the questions to see if they counted transgender people. Mm -hmm. um, and then that ended up in the, that that process ended up in the two step method. But one person said they put a flyer saying, calling transgender people, will you help us with our study? So they put a flyer out asking self-identified transgender people to go and test these questions to find out if they were transgender. So like, that's an example of, you know, the category in your mind creating the population that you, you think you're studying. Right, right. Um, I'd like to move a little bit into the advocacy, the activism side of your career. Uh, I think a lot of us, are interested in combining both advocacy and activism with our scholarship. And we feel that it, um, it sort of is a self-reinforcing thing, that what we learn as scholars, we can apply as advocates. And for many of us, we see our, our work as normatively driven. But that's not always the case, certainly within political science. So um, there are clearly parts of our discipline, the political science discipline, that is very reticent about combining advocacy and activism with scholarship and you know it needs to be abstract and it needs to be untainted by the real world i mean how do you view this hybrid do you see it as um mutually beneficial the two sides of your work do you see um your scholarship informing and helping your advocacy or do you ever see it as actually a hindrance and making it more difficult to be a scholar um yeah, I think yes to everything you just said, but um, let me just give you a few different examples. Um, so for as like a scholar, my having the luck to also be an advocate has really informed my scholarship. So like, for example, I could read every Foucault lecture back to front. I could like recite Timothy, Mil uh, Timothy Mitchell's essay on the state and state effects. I could do all that, but I didn't really figure out the main idea of this book I just finished um, until I was sitting, you know, uh, across the table with a bunch of health folks from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dean, I think is on the call, was, was there too. And they say, well, like, we can't just change the definition of sex because different agencies do different things. Like, that's what all these like fancy theoretical ideas were like, oh, that's what this is about. This is, this is about this project of like, sex as being an instrument of governmentality. But I would never have figured that out without, because we read all the academic stuff and it just, sinks in or doesn't sink in, but I wouldn't have figured that out without kind of actually looking at how like sex becomes this category that is used to kind of regulate people differently in different contexts. Um, there's also other ways in which it, um, it gets in the way a little bit of being a scholar. Like, so I'll get, use the example, I hope Dean doesn't mind, but like Dean Spade wrote this really great essay called Mutilating Genders. Uh, it was published in the early, you know, around 2003, I forget. Great piece, super smart, sort of autoethnographic theoretical piece. It's been, you know, it's been reprinted a billion times, but it's a, a, original, when we first started to get reprinted and excerpted, they would excerpt the narrative part and not so much the theoretical part, mm -hmm. right? So like trans people can be, can represent experience, right? 
but the theoretical apparatus that belongs to the other folks, you know, the, who will look at the, who will take Chinese experience and reinterpret it. So like, um, I always noticed that even if, even like when that uh, decision came down in June on the transgender and gay employees, I went on this, I'd never usually go on the radio or do anything like that because I'm not very good at speaking extemporaneously, but I did do this radio show called 1A and I thought I was on there because I'd written a, thought a lot about transgender and gender identity discrimination, but they had someone from Colombia who was the expert and I, and the questions I got was like, what does it feel like to be a transgender person when this decision comes down? Mm -hmm. So it was fine. I could say, well, I feel happy, uh, but I also, I also wanted to like talk about my ideas about this decision and what it meant and what it didn't mean. So I think that that happens. It doesn't happen so much now in scholarship. It certainly does happen in, um, in um in uh the media and activism like they want to know what you feel yeah. uh what you feel like that so um um yeah as the as the field does become larger and more visible and more and more people feel able and comfortable to sort of be out and open about their own gender identity but also the work they do as it grows does it become more uh, fractious? Does does actually the presence and the visibility lead to a community that is perhaps more fragmented than it was when it was tiny? Yeah, I think there's a there's a perception that it's more fragmented. I don't when it was tiny, you know, like transsexual menace and these early days of transgender nation or whatever. And then we also had this concept of the transgender umbrella where everybody. Uh, you know, who has just gender nonconforming to some degree fits under the transgender umbrella. That um, that unity was probably more of a an idea than something that existed in practice, perhaps. But um, I think um, now that there's 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 um, I don't know if I want to describe it as more fractious because it implies there's something that should have been together and that is now fracturing. <laughs> but I think that there's like many different ways of being gender nonconforming, and some people you know are um, some people find other way, some people find some ways of being gender conforming or non conforming illegible to them. So, um, and I think those changes are not problematic. I think that's just, um, you know, I, I think having more different voices, um, uh, being visible is like a good thing. Now, I, I have a couple more questions uh, on my list, but I want to ask people to start sending me your name if you'd like to get on the question list so we can have people lined up for the second half of this to have a conversation with Paisley as well. I see there are already a number of people praising Paisley's work on the, the chat and also praising uh, Christopher's dog, which is important as well. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the... Uh, the activism side, the advocacy side, I mean, obviously, we're in, as always, a very interesting moment politically around transgender issues of public policy in America. Um, everybody comes up with what needs to be done and their issues that should be strategies that should be made. I would love to hear from you what you think the core strategic choices are to push forward equality in gender identity and the, and the health and well-being of trans and gender non-conforming Americans. I mean, at the end of the day, if we gave you a wand and you could, uh, maybe you have a wand, but if we gave you a wand and you could wave it and said, okay, these three things we're gonna do first, what, what do you really think American public policy needs to focus on when it comes to trans issues? Right, so I think, um, and actually, Andrew sent me this question in advance, so I really still can't speak extemporaneously, but I had a moment to think about it. But I actually think that the moves that would help the most transgender people the most, none of them are transgender specific. So for example, moving, a, we should move away from worrying about discrimination in employment and move towards like a broader structural, uh, uh, asking for broader structural changes to solve the problem of income inequality that would help more trans people than a non-discrimination law. Um, we should, I mean, it's bad what the Trump administration is doing with all these rules and you know the Affordable Care Act rule 1557, all that sort of stuff. But instead of, and fighting those rules, I know that's important, but we should move toward Medicare for all rather than fixing this terrible medical system we have. Because transgender people need, many people require transition related care 
but we also just get sick. <laughs> we have bodies that have other problems. So I think like, again, that would help the more transgender people the most. And of course, any kind of Medicare would all, would all for all would also cover trans related stuff. And, you know, then another, you know, problem area for transgender people is what's happening to people in prison who are, are trans people who are incarcerated, you know, and we could figure out like how best to treat people and you're making sure people get the stuff they need, which is just rearranging chairs on the Titanic. And we really need to kind of work towards, you know, decarceration and eventually prison abolition that would help more trans people the most. So I do worry that we have gotten kind of stuck in this identity politics mode and then the identity politics does what it does best, which is like, it takes, it takes, um, it represents the interests of the, the group, it represents the interests of the people who, but for their status as transgender would be doing fine. So that's not really the more, uh, uh, that wouldn't help most people. So I think we should sort of try to move away from that. Even though transgender is where everybody wants to talk about it, it's very sexy, but I worry that we are in a certain kind of like, you know, what Adolf Reed calls a, what do you call it, representational neoliberalism, or like the, the, the neoliberalism of diversity. Like the best example is like every June when Goldman Sachs flies a transgender flag, like they literally do. I got pictures of it. Someone said to me from Twitter, like that's not what's going to help most transgender people. Right. Um, when we think about, um, the the community the queer community writ large whatever however you define that um clearly there's uh both a practical but also a, a intellectual um tension between the l the b the g the t the q um and other forms of sexual orientation and identity uh, self-defining right um and some of this can be deeply problematic and some of this can be deeply helpful and, and, and supportive. I mean, if you had to sort of stand up and perhaps you do this to your classes, to your students uh, today and give them a little thumbnail sketch of the LGBTQ family and, you know, the fucked up family that it is, the tensions, how do you define, how do you describe that family of the different five? Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's lots of ways to describe the family, but I think your the scenario you described is really interesting because if I were to do that to my students, I wouldn't make any sense to them because they don't have the neat divisions that we do between like categories of gender and categories of sexuality or like they, they do whatever they can to blur those decisions, divisions. Like for example, you know, like bisexual, every time I use, I still say that word and I get in trouble you know, it implies a gender binary. And I think the students are much more, um, like much more at ease with, with all different kinds of gender and sexual diversity. And they're not so much worried about like figuring out like who's who and what they should be doing given that identity. And I think that's, and I think cause you know, we're still a bit of a youth culture. I think that's having good effects on old fogies like me uh, who, you know, like have these categories and we must think in categories. So um, I think the, I mean, I do think what's going on in the United Kingdom around the, uh, what's that called? The GRA, um, mm -hmm. whatever the GRA stands for, um, mm -hmm. and JK Rowling's and all the gender critical feminists, I think that's really kind of troubling. And, uh, and there's, you know, that's, that's, and I don't quite, I can't tell how common that is. Like if that's just like the Twitter ampli amplification effect, yeah. or if there's like a large segment of like, lesbian identified women out there who, who, who think what J.K. Rowling thinks. So that is, that is one, you know, concern. I'm going to come back to you that on a second on that question, but let's take uh, Dean Spade, um, uh, because I think that would be really useful right now. Dean, can you join us? Yeah, I was just, my question for Paisley, um, I've experienced Paisley, you know, for years as like a really broad and deep reader um, who's always brought a lot of things together that aren't always put together. And for, for example, like Paisley, early early in our knowing each other, Paisley was reading critical race theory in particular ways and thinking about law and trans rights really differently than the kind of single issue gay rights model that was being um, you know, proposed as what trans rights should do. And I'm just curious, Paisley, like what you're reading now that is uh, 
that we might not know you're, that you would be reading and how it's influencing how you think about your research. I'm just like, where, like what, what side roads have you gone down that are stimulating? I mean, I remember you changed my life by telling me to read James C. Scott's Seeing Like a State. I mean, so many, so many things you've told me to read uh, changed my research. I'm just curious what you're reading. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I, I mean, what I'm reading now is a little bit odd because I'm a little bit having a trouble with the election and Trump and coronavirus. So the, mo the best book I just read was How to Do Nothing by Jen O'Dell. And it's, it's a great book, and, but it's about like, it sounds like a self-help book, but it's really about like capitalism's attention economy and how like our attention is being focused on all this stuff. So I've been, read that book. I've been reading books about trees and looking at trees and the reading books. So I've been trying to like, because I get on Twitter and I literally feel my blood pressure going up. Like I just get mad at people and then I might send a mean tweet, which hopefully I immediately delete. Like I'm trying to kind of move away from that kind of, um, that kind of thing. But this, this um, book, I think it was, is it Odell or just Dell? Anyway, I think it's Odell. But, um, but her book actually talks about like being located in a time and place. And it does this kind of great kind of stuff in terms of creating an attention, creating attention in your time and place, including your like, um, the, your bio region to sort of think about like how we exist in that space in relationship to the physical architecture and the concrete and the little weeds coming up through the cracks. Um, and I don't think there's a payoff in terms of trans studies, but I think there's got to be a payoff in terms of like thinking of ways to move for, forward together because we're, we're in a space now, like look at us, we don't get to be with people anymore. And some people don't even want to be with people. And one of the things um, that was really helpful to me during the coronavirus crisis was in my neighborhood, we had a mutual aid society. Um, and Dean has written and talked about this, is, uh, which has been very helpful, um, where people were like just helping people out, like delivering groceries, buying groceries, chipping in. And like, so you're meeting people of all from all different walks of life across the neighborhood. And it made me very hopeful because I think we, the social media we, we exist in now, there's no trust. There's no like, well, how can we fight for income inequality? Like I've been, you know, I said I'm for income. I'm saying I want to fight it on Twitter, but like, what can we actually do? We don't have these like venues and mechanisms and ways of being together where we could like start to see people in their, in their habitus and our habitus and, and develop trust. And that's in, in terms of moving forward, like the big old communists like Jody Dean will say, oh, that's just a mutual aid. That's just self-help. We need to smash the state. But I think we can't really change the world until we develop more, you know, on the ground local connections um, that aren't organized around identity so much. Um, when we, uh, you mentioned earlier about the controversy in the, the UK, especially, but also in New Zealand and elsewhere. I mean, have you um, had pushback from TERFs, from um, other groups that may actually make your advocacy and, and scholarship more difficult because there's, there's a tension there between trans-exclusionary radical feminists? And do you find that you are a focal point for that? Uh, no, I don't think it's really cut off any venues for me. But I had this thing happen this is <laughs> where in May, like the body shop sent JK Rawlings a gift bag of like calming lotions. And then they tweeted, they said, we're sending you this so you can calm down and not be so mean to transgender people. And we're also sending you a copy of Transgender Rights by Paisley Cura and they tagged me. Hmm. So I had 14 million of JK Rawlings Twitter followers. Mm -hmm like yelling at me on Twitter, <laughs> like, you know, I kept, all I did was like block people. I have like a block list of 3,500 people now, but I mean, that was, that was, but that was before I bought the Jen O'Dell book and just like move away. Um, but it is, um, engage, that kind of engagement is really, um, it doesn't really, that, I mean, I, I appreciate people in uh, like uh, Sally Hines and folks in the UK who kind of engage with that and try to change minds. And I think it probably does work. Um, but I think, I don't know, maybe other people can speak to that. I don't really see, a, I don't really see a huge amount of that kind of discourse and activism, if you want to call it that, happening in the United States, which is, which is good. But it, they haven't got, they haven't gotten in my way. I just block everybody. So right. everybody wants my block list, I can export it to you. That's probably uh, a significant part of your workday, blocking people. <laughs> oh, I, I, got to, do. I don't look at Twitter I mean, anymore. <laughs> if 30% of our time is emails and the other 40% is blocking, then 
then what time is there for going to the pool? Yeah. Um, so uh, let me take uh, Hillary, Hillary Vandenbach. Yeah, Paisley, it's great to see you. Again. Good to see you. And I'm so grateful to be here and hear more about this work. And I'm so excited to keep going with the series. Um, but I was wondering about Andy's question about how to describe the LGBTQ family. And so we see that construction of family kind of come up again, like chosen family in LGBTQ circles. Um, but I, whenever I think of family, I think about Patricia Hill Collins article from the early 90s, it's all in the family where she argues from a critical race feminism standpoint that the family is the introduction and the socialization of hierarchy within society. So do you, um, in your research or in your thought process, do you see that hierarchization getting recreated within LGBTQ spaces and families? That's a really good question. Um... I don't find I don't find the metaphor of a family to be like to be particularly useful because so many people in queer and trans communities like that's just trauma to them. So like that metaphor doesn't get make it doesn't necessarily bring up a lot of happy a lot of happy uh, happy feelings. Um, and I don't know if chosen family can overcome that. Maybe it does for some people, but I mean I don't know the answer to your question. But I think it's um it's an important to kind of think about like you know how those. A metaphor is not just a metaphor, but it's like a, a structure and a, and a hierarchy. Great, thank you. Let me uh, solicit again. Anybody um, who wants to jump on now with comments or questions? Let me, um, let me push this back a little bit to your future work. Um, you talked about the book that you're writing now and how it was informed by public health um, attitudes to some extent. Um, what, um, what do you hope to be doing over the next few years? Do you think you wanna stay within the same sort of theme of uh, focus that you've been working on? Or do you have aspirations to move slightly outside of the field that we know you for? Yeah, no, I, I think I would like to move away from trans. I haven't exactly figured out a project because I'm just putting this book to bed, but um, just, you know, I'm personally sort of oh, a little tired of it as an uh, organizing principal. But of course, that's where I have currency and that's where my voice gets heard. You know, I've been doing a lot of hiking and I'd like to figure out how to make all my nature trips tax deductible from an next research project, but I haven't figured that out yet. Um, I have to think of something that I could possibly actually do. Um, but I think what I, I think what's, I'm really interested in is, is just kind of like looking at like the little, you know, the little bits of different areas of trans advocacy and seeing how they could be broken up even more. So example, in this book I just finished, I have the, you know, I talk about incarceration and how, you know, the mainstream advocacy around it. You know, and the, the, even though the mainstream advocacy, like this would be like the Human Rights Campaign or National Center for Transgender Equality, even though they acknowledge how like, you, you, when you look at trans prisoners, you also have to look at like uh, race, basically, and poverty. They still kind of package the problem as a, as a transgender problem rather than a problem of prisons. And they said, you know, transgender women of, or trans, transgender black people are like five times as likely to be incarcerated as transgender white people. That's true, and that's terrible. Black people are five times as likely to be incarcerated as white people, right? But somehow the identity politics framing of it doesn't make you think of the larger problem. Like those statistics are like yeah. perfectly in line with each other. So there's a ways in which like the race kind of just drops right out of it again. So um, I'm in, I am interested in kind of like take, looking at little pieces and kind of taking them a little apart a, a bit more and, and, and showing how, how uh, these kind of framings, even though as they kind of make a nod towards towards white supremacy, they don't, they still, still the way they're packaged, they, uh, they almost in some sense further white supremacy. There's this great piece by, um, it's an old piece, but it's still good by uh, Raleigh Snorton and Jin Haridharan that talks about like the transgender day of remembrance as a source of value for white LGBTQ organizations, you know, because everybody celebrates, the not celebrates, but memorializes the transgender day of remembrance and it turns all these deaths into sources, like into value for like white led organizations. So um, um, 
and it's hard because I go to you know, my campus, the students are really into it. And we have this ceremony by the pond and everybody holds a candle. And I understand like there's a certain kind of effective importance of those kinds of thinking about the, memorializing those kinds of deaths. And it's not like any, but any group at Brooklyn College is making any money on that sort of thing. But um, so I, I'm interested in kind of like taking things apart, apart a bit more and, uh, and basically undermining the trans, transgender rights agenda, <laughs> I guess. Actually, I want to take a question from Zain Marib. Um, but first, let me just briefly, I know it's somewhat controversial, but um, how well has the trans community been served by LGBTQ advocacy institutions? So I know there have been controversies around specific trans organizations, but HRC and Victory Fund and uh, NCTE and all these, I mean, to what extent do you feel they have well served the trans community? And then we'll take time. Well, I think like for HRC, I think the trans community is an instrument to them, right? <clears throat> they don't, they didn't care about transgender issues when they should have cared. And now that transgender issues are like a possible source of funding for them, they care. So, you know, and so, I mean, and HRC, um, I think Ken is on this call. I think he pointed out one time on Twitter or something, but HRC, HRC like has never gets anything done except for raise a lot of money. Um, but um, so that's, 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 an, they, so trans people are just instrumental. It's like, oh, we've got gay marriage. We've got all this stuff. Like, let's see where we can grab some funding from Soros on a transgender rights project. So you can talk to like Mora Cabral and Eustace Icefield about what they think of LGB organizations, LGBT organizations grabbing that kind of money. Um, I think National Center for Transgender Rights is like in a different place because they've certainly like produced a lot of really useful information and collect information and like, you know, I think that's at a national level, that's important. But I think that something happens to these organizations, they start to kind of go to DC and go to fundraisers and cocktail things. And they just become part of this, they, they kind of develop the worldview of the of the folks they're, they're meeting with all the time. And um, they lose their any kind of, they often their, their relationship to the so called grassroots becomes very kind of attenuated. So, um, so I just think, you know, there needs to be more local organizing rather than less, but that's not how the media landscape we find ourselves in works these days. Right, right. I understand. Okay, let me go to Zain. Uh, hi, everyone. And just I want to say thanks for the opportunity to to listen in on this. And thanks to Andy to convening and Paisley for sharing uh, thoughts on things. My question is, I was really intrigued by the title of this session, uh, Transphobia, and I was thinking about it in relationship to homophobia, which I think um, we know a lot of the problems with, right? It individualizes acts of violence. It pathologizes certain groups, particularly people of color, as 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 uh, pathologically uh, homophobic. And I guess I'm curious to hear, Paisley, your thoughts on ways that uh, transphobia can be reframed, because I think you know you've talked a little bit about this by citing the Harita Warren, uh, Harita Warren and Snorton piece. Um, we hear a lot about uh, violence against trans people, but I'm wondering about ways that we can reframe the ways that we understand that violence uh, in our scholarship in particularly, right? Um, and not reproduce uh, some of, I think, the, the problems that, that came about with this discourse on homophobia. Yeah, I think that's really important. Like, so for example, everybody talks about violence against transgender women of color, <clears throat> which is obviously important and it's a crucial problem but somehow like the transgender becomes the master category right and the ways in which misogyny structures the violence that they experience in a, in a maybe slightly different but not completely different way that the violence that cis women experience so for me like understanding those kind of like violence against transgender women transgender women of color as a kind of you know really truly gender-based violence would be, would be helpful but you see like an um even at the level of the UN, you have this special repertoire, what is it, on you know, gender identity. I don't know if you got re-upped. Re um, and some groups kind of respond to that. They're like, you know, violence that women experience is, is, is cuts, cuts across gender identity. And this kind of construction of a, a special guy who's gonna look at just gender identity, which of course we understand gender identity has, applies to everybody, but it's a code word for trans. So there are ways in which those, 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 uh, 
you know, points of, of, of uh, continuity get erased and, and the reification of this, you know, of this transgender category. So, and I think the violence against transgender women of color is terrible. So is the violence against transgender or non-transgender women of color or, you know, violence against all women. But that kind of drops through the equation. And I think it might be because of how the funding works and how the media apparatus works and like how you can get... Um, attention to transgender issues that you might not actually get sometimes to like just old fashioned bread and butter feminist issues. So I appreciate your question. Let us take uh, Liz Barker. You have a question or a comment from Baroness Barker. Yeah, hi, thank you so much. Um, that was a really uh, most informative uh, uh, presentation. I've been busy scribbling away like mad on, on your references, your, your great reading list. Um, I just wanted to say two things. I mean, one is the, the awful, horrible, toxic argument which is raging at the moment here in the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, around it's it's centered around the reform of the GRA, but uh, which is Gender Recognition Act, um, but it is fueled by right-wing evangelical money from America. That much, that much we uh, we know. Um, it has it is awful and it is really truly having a toll on people uh, here, uh, and not just trans people but also their allies. Um, but at the same time, it has opened up a discussion in the community between all the different uh, initials. And we are beginning to talk to each other about what we have in common and what we don't share. And that applies equally to all of the, uh, to, to all of the, uh, the, the initials, intersected, as you said, by other, other other factors such as race and uh, ethnicity and uh, uh, and uh, affluence. Um, the question I wanted to ask you is this: um, In the United Kingdom, um, there are two main drivers uh, for the uh, anti-trans uh, campaign. Uh, one is um, a media which is at best ill-informed and very ill-informed on the subject and even the best of journalists uh, treat this uh, treat this subject uh, in ways that they just simply would not do with any other form of discrimination. But the other is academics. We have a lot of academics uh, who are feminists, claim to be feminist and lesbian, and who bring to their anti-trans beliefs a sort of I would a sort of tinge of uh, academic uh, um, ac uh, academic authority, and I wondered whether that is something that you also have in the United States, and have you as a as an academic come up against that, and if so, how do you deal with it? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I haven't, but you know, my experience in the world of peer review and journals is like it's kind of a it's not like regular journals that might publish, um, or not really the regular, but like the disciplinary journal that's just a little bit off to the right. Like I don't really have a lot of, you know, no one, I don't have a lot of contact with them or, or asked to review pieces like that. But I get, I don't, and th this would be a good question for other people maybe who are on the call or others. It doesn't seem like there's the same sort of number of legitimate anti-trans academics publishing in the United States as in the UK, but that's a huge generalization, but that's my impression. But again, I'm, I'm a little, um, my, my perspective is skewed. But I, what I find so fascinating, because I did, was on that Twitter war and I saw the, the usual things they say about trans women in the bathrooms is like, I don't get, I don't get why they're not mad at men. <laughs> like, you know, like, not to be like essentialist, but like men do bad stuff. And they're like, they, they, you know, they're, they're, they're against, they're campaigning against rape and assault and stuff. And they think trans women are, they are the, the agents of that, but they don't really think that it's some weird displacement, but like, it's like men are too powerful, white men are too powerful to be named as like the problem. So they're worried about this one trans woman who wants to go to the bathroom in peace. Like it's just, it's shocking. But what you say, you point out what the media is also shocking to me. Like I was just a year or two ago when the Guardian published a, like an editorial, you know, against the GRA, I was just shocked. I stopped reading the Guardian for a year or two there. I just, I couldn't believe it. 
Great. I, I, yeah, I certainly think it's true that at least the perception, it feels like there's more um, mainstream uh, hostility uh, within the Commonwealth, within Britain and New Zealand to, uh, to trans rights uh, than even in the sort of mainstream journalistic world in the US. Um, let's take uh, Chris Hansman. Hi there. Um, Paisley, thanks so much for this this talk and, and thanks to the organizers as well. I've learned so much from your work um, in the past and I'm happy to be learning more about it now. Um, quick question. Um, I really loved your point about how we need to stop talking about transphobia, um, even though we also can't. Um, and I love the, the sort of exemplification of that in thinking about focusing on, you know, universal health care rather than Section 1557. Um, and you mentioned mutual aid, but I'm curious if you have any other thoughts about the most kinds of exciting and compelling work you see people doing um, in taking that kind of more expansive approach, whether yeah, that activism. That's really a question, and Dean just left the call, but um, I think he was chatting about it earlier. Um, I think he has much more on, on the ground experience, but like the way that trans communities have been helping each other out, you know, from like, the kind of, you know, whatever those parties were called for raising money for surgery or rent or providing, you know, housing for transitional, for transitional people. Like there's just a, so much kind of on the ground work. And it's not just a trans thing. It's like all these different kinds of communities have that. And I feel like uh, that's something that we like, you know, need, need to like valorize and pay more attention to. I mean, I'm not saying like, don't ask the government for things because clearly the government should give us everything. Um, but also like, it's just a way of like, uh, turning people from like these like you know as Chris can tell talk about more like overstudied objects of research into people who kind of create their own life worlds and networks and shared values and like that kind of gets dropped out when we're always talking about um, you know we're always harnessing this word transphobia to explain um, explain everything. Wonderful. Um, okay, we are coming up to exactly two o'clock. Um, really would like to thank all of you for joining us again today. And thank you so much, Paisley, for, for, for talking us through your work and um, uh, your, your future plans. And again, thank you for um, just being a terrific resource. And, and even if you didn't realize it, everybody else was reading your work for a long time before <laughs> you, you became famous. And you've also been an incredibly great advisor and uh, mentor to, to me setting up my stuff. So I thank you for that as well. Um, so thank you. Uh, next week, just to remind you, we're going to speak to Hannah Bardell, the Scottish National Member for Livingston in Scotland. Um, and one of the interesting things about Scotland is that they are one of the first countries who are going to be mainstreaming LGBTQ education in um, what is uh, to Americans K through 12 uh, public schools um, and how you actually manage that. Um, new public policy choice where you actually uh, provide significant LGBTQ education um, for all schools in Scotland. It's a nice little controlled experiment. We'll see what happens to the Scots over the next 20, 30 years. Um, so thank you, everybody, and keep well and safe, and we will see you next week at the same time. Um, again, we are taking uh, applications to be as part of the series in the spring. We are totally full now uh, for the rest of this year, but please, if you'd like to present or talk or have a discussion or recommend somebody else, please let us know and we'll be lining up our spring schedule. So thank you everybody and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.